morning, Crossroads Church. We are so glad that you're with us today. Whether you're joining us in the room or online, we're so glad to have you, and uh, we're glad that you made us part of your day. We realize you had a lot of choices, but you included us, so we're very thankful for that. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hey, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. But while you're doing that, I'm going to... Uh, kind of recap what we've been doing the last few weeks. We've been preaching a series called Meals with Jesus. Meals with Jesus. And this we started this out, we thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, and now it's more than that. And uh, I think today may be the last one, but we'll see. Uh, you know what we've been doing is looking at these situations where uh, Jesus was sharing a meal either with his disciples Maybe, maybe some friends, or uh, like today, it was a very large crowd that he shared the meal with. Uh, and, but there's principles, there's spiritual principles that we can see that are un, uh, uncovered or developed as we look at these um, situations. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, it's been a couple, more than a couple of weeks, but on Easter Sunday, uh, we talked about Jesus on the road to Emmaus and how that... Um, he was, you remember he, he, after the resurrection, he was following along. He met some folks on the road to Emmaus. These guys were uh, talking among themselves, and Jesus encountered them and, and had a conversation with them. And then uh, it was uh, when he came in, it was when he came in and joined them for a meal that they said, our eyes were open, and we realized this was Jesus. That recognition of Jesus' presence in their lives. And then I shared a message a few weeks ago on Peter's restoration. Remember, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus is on the seashore, and he invites the fishermen to come have breakfast, and that's when he restores Peter back into fellowship after Peter had denied Jesus and, and disappointed him. And then uh, Pastor Trav shared a message about Matthew, the tax collector, and such an important message to think about how that our, our table, so to speak, and when we say table, we mean our, our lives, our uh, carry, you know, carrying out our duties and our daily routines, they should be a place where sinners are welcome, where sinners are welcome. And when we, uh, when we look about how we conduct ourselves, are we judgmental, are we exclusive, and making sure that we allow for the, the world around us to be impressed with Jesus through exposure to us. And then last week, Pastor Alex shared a great message on Mary and Martha. And man, what a great reminder. What a great reminder of the importance of sitting at Jesus' feet. Sitting at Jesus' feet. Remember he talked about that, how Mary and Martha, one was more concerned about serving, the other was more concerned about spending time with Jesus. How important it is for us. I want to talk to you this morning about the biggest, the biggest meal that Jesus shared, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. Let's pick it up in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read 13 verses there. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's important for us to read scripture out loud from time to time. Uh, you know, I think maybe we could do more of that in church because there's a wonderful thing that happens when we read scripture out loud. You know what that is? The enemy has to listen to it. <laughs> so he either has to listen to it or flee, but one way or the other, I don't care. But I, I want to read today from John chapter 6. It says this, After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, and a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went. Because, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him, and turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Verse 6, I want you to pay attention to that one in particular. It says, He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he planned to do. He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Verse 7, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, there is a young boy with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? 
verse 10, it says, tell everyone, Jesus speaking, tell everyone to sit down. So they sat down on the grassy slope, and the men alone numbered about 5,000. Now, I want to just hit the pause button there long enough to remind you that this, the culture in which this is written was very chauvinistic, and so uh, women and children were not allowed to even uh, testify in court. They weren't recognized in that manner. It's very, very chauvinistic culture. And, uh, and so when it says he fed the 5,000, I think we underestimate what happened here because that verse says just right there, it says, well, the men were about five because that's who they would count in that situation with that social structure. But I think it's important for us to recognize that simply because if there are 5,000 men there, 5,000 men were there, you know there was at least 5,000 women there, probably more. And I'm just going to say right now, thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies, over the generations for keeping the church afloat. When the men dropped the ball and didn't do their job, you stayed in there and you hung in, you prayed through, you preached through, you, you encouraged, you, you lectured, you did whatever it had to be done to keep a... So when we say 5,000 men, there was at least 5,000 ladies, and then, of course, children beyond that. So many, many Bible scholars believe what we're actually looking at here is the feeding of fifteen to 20,000 people. That is significant. And I want you to keep that in mind as we finish this up. I want you to keep that in mind. 20,000 probably or more. It says, then Jesus took the loaves. Verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. And after everyone was full, he did the same with the fish, and they ate as much as they wanted. They ate as much as as they wanted. I'll say that one more time. They ate as much as they wanted. And when everyone was full, it says, they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with the scraps that were left over. I want that to sink in for just a second. This is an amazing thing we're seeing happening here, and we're going to take it apart more in just a moment. But it says when, they, when everyone had as much as they wanted, when they were full, they picked up 12 baskets of scraps. Now, I was not raised with Common Core math, so I know how to add and subtract. <laughs> how do you start with a Lunchable and then end up with enough to have another feast altogether? That's remarkable. I want that to sink in for just a second. 15, 20,000 people gathered on the hillside. They take a Lunchable, five barley loaves, probably about like that, and two fish, probably a little bigger than a sardine, but probably uh, prepared similarly to that where they could pack it around in their lunch. And so a couple of small St. Peter's fish, they call them sometimes over there, about this long. So maybe a couple of those and five barley loaves. I want you to think about that. I'm exaggerating this. Or, I mean, repeating this till you get this in your mind. We start with that and we end up feeding 15, 20, 25,000 people and we pick up 12 baskets of scraps after everyone was full. I didn't know it until I was much, much older, but I grew up pretty poor. Don't feel sorry for me. We were in the time of our lives. The big surprise to me when I got older and realized we didn't have any money. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. This, my mom's been gone for uh, this September be 44 years. And this last Mother's Day, I don't know, it's, some of you know what I'm talking about. You, those of you who lost loved ones, uh, this last Mother's Day was just one of those times where you get this, another wave. It might go years and then you get a wave and just everything reminds you. We had a, we had a, a yellow bird that, I, to my knowledge, we've never had in our yard before. We had a bright yellow bird that was flying around in our front yard for a few days. And, and I thought that was such a good reminder to me. Because my mom's favorite color was yellow. She loved yellow. So every, I thought about her when I was looking at that bird. And a lot of different, you know what occurred to me the other day? I, I, we had a lot of, uh, well, my grandmother was from the South. So we had fried something and gravy at every dinner. 
if we didn't have that, we had rice and beans. And, and uh, don't feel bad for us there either, because my dad taught me how to use, how to, how to eat. Okay, so it pretty much destroys any nutritional value of the beans. <laughs> and we know that rice is just a quick way to, to develop sugar, but... Uh, but my dad, I was like, man, how does he, he's just loving these beans. I'm like, what is that crusty thing on top of your, you know, uh, now I'm going to make you hungry. We got just a few more minutes before you go to lunch, but how many of you know how to eat red beans and rice? I mean, there's an art to that. And it's, you know, you fix it with ham hock or salt pork or something, and it cooks all day. It's just amazing. You walk in the house, you smell it. It's like, oh my goodness, that's great. And I looked at my dad's plate, I'm like, your beans are shiny, mine are not, what's happening? He said, don't tell your mom, but I put sugar on them. I'm candy and rice, <laughs> and it's awesome. I'm not going to lie, it's awesome. But I was thinking back to some of those things, and, and you know, uh, my, my mom, we always had rice and gravy. Every, every dinner, the, I, there was rice involved in some way, shape, or form, and almost always had gravy with it. Sometimes we even had mashed potatoes and rice and gravy. It was kind of crazy and wonderful. Now you see why I never knew we were poor. I just thought that's the way everybody ate. And I feel sorry for those of you that had money and didn't eat that way. That's just, uh, you're, you miss out, but... But I thought about, you know, there were times I don't remember my mom eating. I mean, I can't see her sitting at the table. But what I do remember is her running around serving us up. When I read this story, that's why it's so remarkable to me. We started with a Lunchable. And we fed everybody till they were full. Nobody... Nobody, no moms were sitting outside on the edge saying, well, I'm just going to make sure Junior gets fed first. Everybody ate until they were full. That's what it says. And you know, when we look at this, I think there's some really important things that are revealed in this story. When we read this story, it's just, it's an amazing story in and of itself. But I think it really reveals some deeper truths that we would do well to pay attention to. First thing foremost in, in this whole story is it reveals who Jesus is. It reveals a lot about our Jesus, if you think about it. You know, when you look at it, Jesus was the one who uh, had a plan when it doesn't seem like he had a plan. Did you catch that in verse 6? It says, he was asking him, how are we going to feed all these people? There's always, see, that's Terry in our relationship. I'm the dreamer. I have these big goals and, and flighty dreams, and, and uh, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the idea guy, right? I guess, like, we're going to do this thing, and everybody in town is going to love it. We're going to have everybody. And Terry's like, well, yeah, but we're going to need tables. I don't care about that. <laughs> don't be killing my dream here trying to figure out how we're going to get enough cars together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just, we all need those people. And Jesus, Jesus kind of pulled that. He goes, well, how are we going to feed all these people? I don't know. We'd have to work for months to get enough money. Especially when gas is $5 a gallon and you don't have enough. I mean, we'd have to work months. Good news is there's lots of jobs available for those that want to work. But we'd have to work months to feed all these people. It says Jesus was testing him. Did you catch that? Because he already knew what he was going to do. Let me just tell you something that may come as a surprise to you, but regardless of how ridiculous, and this, this message, by the way, is non-political. I'm, I'm going to say some things that might lead you to believe that we're thinking, I'm just talking about culture, okay? Not politics, just culture. But the, the, the culture we live in, I don't know if you figured it out or not, but um, it seems like we've lost the plan. Here's the good news. Jesus still has a plan. And it started before we even came around. Before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. That's what, he had a plan before we even screwed up the first time. He knew we were going to mess up. He knew how we are. We're prone to fail. We're, we're stubborn. We're rebellious people. And he had a plan all along. Praise God. That's one of these you want to just stand up and go, hallelujah. 
had a plan. Didn't look like it. What's the plan? We can't feed all these people. Are you kidding me right now? Do you know how much that guy eats? I've seen. No, listen, there. he has a plan. He already knew what he was going to do. And you know, when we look in our lives, sometimes we think, I don't know, I think God's forgotten the plan. Here's the thing. I think the reason we do that is because our plan and his plan often don't look the same. After experimenting with my plans, I'm here to tell you it's better to go with his plan. The scripture says many of the plans in a man's heart, but the ones that the Lord designs will prosper. There's, there's a need for us to recognize that, hey, wait a minute. God has a plan, even when it doesn't look like there's a plan. God has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11, we quote it often. It's been on all kinds of posters and plaques, and it's been a great uh, moneymaker for Christian bookstores if there are any left, or online maybe, I don't know. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not disaster. And give you a future and a hope. That's a New Living Translation. I'm, I memorize New International Version. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Either way, it's still the same thing. What is the reason we lose hope? Think about that for a second. What is the reason we lose hope? Because we can't see the end. Or we see what we think is the end and it disappoints us. Now look at this verse one more time. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to, pros to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for a hope and a future. I'm here to tell you today that if we pay more attention to his plan and less attention, how about we just ditch our plan altogether? If we pay attention to his plan, we, don't, we can have hope because he's got a plan. He's got a future. Peter, I think it is, that writes to us and says, be ready to give an answer for those that ask you, what is that hope you have within you? Because we know where we're going. We know where you we're going. God has a plan. He's had it all along. The first passage of scripture we had our kids memorize when they were old enough was John chapter 14, first six verses. You know why? Because it reveals the plan. Don't be upset or worried, he tells his disciples. I'm going to go away. And it's going to, there's going to be some things that are going to change around here, but I'm going to go away, but I'm coming back for you. I'm going to go work on the house that God's building for you. Can I just remind you that it's not as though when the first generation of believers started passing away that heaven was in an uproar and they, oh, dear Lord, we got to prepare for these people that are coming to heaven. No. Are you kidding me? He was ready. He has a plan. We can have confidence. We can have hope. We can rely on his plan because it's going to work if we trust his plan. Second thing this reveals to us, I think, as we look at this story, <clears throat> it reveals a lot about the crowd we live in. People haven't changed much over the last several thousand years. Same things drive us, same issues divide us. And whether it's politics or race or unrest or crime or, you know, I mean, we got a world that's looking for answers. And as smart as we are, and as developed as we are, and as scientific as we are, as technology savvy as other people are, <laughs> still live in a world full of people looking for answers. And nothing's changed. <clears throat> you know, as a musician, singer, I marked decades by popular songs that Terry and I were made to sing. <laughs> We got invited. We used, to, we used to do a lot more of that than we do. We haven't done anything lately, but we used to do a lot of different things: camp meeting, general council, or district council, and different things. And we'd sing it. And it's funny because you mark certain eras: late '70s, early '80s. 
I sang this song so many times, I thought if I ever have to sing it again, I'm going to throw up. But the message of the song is, is gripping. <clears throat> and as I was thinking about this message and the crowd that we walk around in every day, I was reminded of a song that I sang way too many times. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we ever learn? People need the Lord. The verse is the one that grabs me every time. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. People hearts that are filled with care headed who knows where people need the Lord you realize that don't you people need the Lord when will we ever learn people need the Lord we're surrounded by a crowd that what were, why were they fall? Why were they following him? Well, verse 4, isn't it, I think, tells us that. It says they followed him because they'd seen him do the miraculous. We, we need to really press in to the presence of God in our daily lives. Individually and as a group, we need to really press in. And we need to be so filled with the power of God in our lives. We need to be so close and radiating the presence of God in our lives to the point where people will look at us and see the hope that they're looking for. I was in a conference with pastors, and please don't, like I said, this could sound political, it's not. But I was in a group of pastors, about 100 of us, I think, maybe, maybe there's more. Uh, and all from Oregon, and we were in a conference, a seminar, one-day seminar the other day, uh, and uh, one of the guests via Zoom was a pastor in Washington. He pioneered a church, and it's thriving in Washington. A great his name's Wes Davis. It, watch anything you see or hear, uh, listen to the podcast, whatever. He's a great, he's a great speaker. He, he's, he reminds me of myself in some ways because he... he often doesn't finish sentences, you know, he gets distracted by things. But So I, I like listening to him because I can, I can follow him. I know where he's going. <laughs> but he asked the question right off the bat. He goes, I think Oregon and Washington are a lot alike. He said, how many of you think that more people left Oregon this last year than came in? And all of us go, absolutely, no question about it. He goes, actually, that's not true. He said, if you do the research, you'll find that I think it was either 3,000 or 30,000 more people moved into Oregon than moved out. He said, you know why we think that they all left? Because the people leaving are the Christians. No judgment there. I'm just telling you, I'm just reporting facts. One of the thoughts that came to me when we live in a crowd full of people that are lost and looking for hope, I don't think in a dark room the thing to do is, hey, let's put out one more candle and see if it gets brighter in here. Okay, I'm over that for just a second, but listen, if ever this crowd needed to see hope, it's now. And we are the bearers of hope. That brings me to my third point this morning. The other thing that this reveals, well, I'm sorry, let me catch that verse. Thank you, Deanna. Matthew chapter 9 tells us this, says that Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. He had compassion. That word in the Greek, compassion, sometimes in earlier translation here, it says they were moved in their, it's gross sounding, but in their bowels. It's, talking, it's a word that means it was a deep feeling. And that's what they're talking about here with this compassion, the word we translate compassion. There was a deep feeling that Jesus had in his being that, that brought him, at times we see, in tears as he wept over Jerusalem. 
But here it says he was moved with compassion for the crowd because they were what? They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Can I make a bold statement today that you may or may not agree with until you think about it? We can, we can badmouth and complain and point fingers at all these people doing all this stuff that's wrong and bad and not what we would do. Jesus looks at them and says they're harassed. They're helpless. In fact, I'm going to be a little bit bolder. They're doing what sinners do, friends. Our job is not to chastise them for being sinners. Our job is to give them a better answer. Because you know why they're doing what they're doing that disgusts us, that bothers us, that irritates us, that drives us insane? Because they're looking for hope and they can't find it. The drugs aren't doing it. The illicit sex isn't doing it. The pornography's not doing it. The alcohol is not doing it. All these other things, it's not doing it. So why are, we, why are we putting them down? Why aren't we showing them a better way? They were harassed and helpless like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. Again, Peter reminds us, People ask you, be prepared. When people ask you, what is that hope you have within you? Third point I want to bring to your attention is it reveals a lot about this story. Reveals, and when I say story, I want you to, I want to remind you, I'm just, I guess I'm assuming this, but I'm not talking about like a fable or a, a bedtime story or something. I mean, this is, this is history. This is history. This isn't just made up. So when I say story, I'm talking about this episode in the ministry of Jesus. It's, it really happened. There's real people, historical fact. And we know this uh, from writings from way back, not just the Bible, but for other writings. I mean, we know about these events that happened. And so when we look at this, what it reveals is a lot about us. It does tell us a lot about Jesus. It does identify the crowd we're walking among. But it also points out some things in our lives that we would do well to pay attention to. This may come as a surprise to you, but you have what it takes to change the situation. Some of you, I can hear the thoughts. I'm not a mind reader, but I can just imagine, I should say, what you're thinking. Oh, you don't know my story. You don't know my background. You know the shame. You don't know the, the mistakes. You don't know the baggage that I've, you don't know where I've been. You don't know where I'm from. You don't know who, you know, you don't know who raised me. You don't know all my, you know, I mean, we just have this litany of th reasons why we can't be of use to God and his kingdom, all of which don't matter one bit. Oh, they matter, but I'm just saying they don't matter when, as, as, as they don't qualify as an excuse to not make ourselves available to be used by God. Because there's a hero in this story. I don't know if you've met him or not. I'm going to call him Billy because, you know, I, I, there's some people in the Bible story. I'm like, dude, they should have got a name. They should have got a mention. And I don't know, Billy just seems like a name. Okay, so it wouldn't have been a name for a Jewish boy. But let's just go with Billy. <laughs> Billy shows up, apparently the only one who packed a lunch that day. Now, Billy really isn't the hero. Billy's mom is probably the one that was the hero. <laughs> Billy forgot to put his coat on before he left the house, but mom said, hey, take this with you. Hey, 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 come here. Take this with you. By the way, give me a hug. You can't leave the house without giving me a hug. Get, kiss your mom. You never get too old to kiss your mom. Take this lunch with you. It's important. I'm not hungry. Take the lunch. Why? Out of thousands of people, one person shows up with lunch. You know, when I look at this hero, I look at Billy and I think, you know what? There's a couple things about Billy I just automatically start loving. And the one is, Billy came prepared. I want to ask you a question. And this, listen, please don't get mad at me for just asking the obvious. I'm just a I'm just a vessel of the Holy Spirit here today. This is not my thoughts. I'm just sharing what God put on my heart to give you. I'm not pointing fingers at you personally. But when was the last time you got up and you, you brushed your hair, you brushed your teeth, you shaved your face, 
And guys, you too, whatever your routine is, I'm just... A... Oh, yeah, sorry. I don't know, baby. I don't know, what, I don't know what girls do to get ready. Probably not shave their face. Whoops. You know, it's not... No, whatever. When was the last time you were doing that, whatever that is? And this thought crossed your mind. No, not, I need a different color lipstick. When was the last time this thought crossed your mind? I wonder who God's going to send into my path today. God, help me be ready for that person. Because I'm going to be wandering around in a group full of people who have no hope. And they may look to me, what am I going to tell them, God? Give me something. When was the last time we spent just a half a second preparing ourselves for the routine of the day that we just got so used to? It's just like, it's just another day, another dollar. Actually, anymore, it's like 50 cents. But another day, another 50 cents. And, and, you know, but when was the last time you got up and said, God, I want to be used by you today. And I just want you to prepare my heart. right now. Before I even leave the house, I want you to give me that preparation. Help me understand Help me understand who I'm going to see and what I should say. And give me the boldness. God, give us eyes that see needs. Give us ears that hear cries. Give us hearts that respond to the needs that we're going to encounter today. Because you know what else about Billy I like? Is he was willing to share. So here's, here's you and I on the hillside, okay? Just bear with me. Hey, you can't prove it otherwise. So, I mean, it's not in the story, so just roll with it. So it's like, it's, it's like 12, 15. It's like, man, I'm getting hungry. Sure glad mom made me take this lunch. There's a lot of people out here. What are you eating, Billy? Nothing. But that's not Billy. Billy heard other stomachs growling. He said, hey, it's not much, but I've heard this guy can do amazing things with not a lot. Take it. Do you remember what we read a moment ago? Five little rolls, a couple of sardines, and we've got baskets left over. Because Billy understood something, I think, that you and I miss too many times, and that is this, that little becomes much in the hand of the master. God is not asking you to bring the whole feast. He's asking you to surrender your lunch. Not like the bully in the cafeteria, but he wants us to have hearts that are that generous, hearts that are that open, hearts that, are, that hold on loosely to the things that we have and are willing to give and to share and to provide for other people. You say, well, I've worked hard for that. I've, I've saved up or I've done. It doesn't really matter, does it? If we have something that can be used by God, why are we not more ready and willing to give that? Here's what I don't understand about this story, and that is that whether they brought nothing or not, everybody got to eat. See, we live in a world filled with entitlement, and I don't have enough time in my life to address that issue. Whether they brought nothing or not, they got to eat. Let me say that one more time. Whether they brought nothing or not, they got to eat. Where do we get off as a body of Christ saying, well, we'll pick the ones that get to be blessed by this ministry. God, give us people that come with nothing so that we can share our lunch with them. Because that's when life happens, is out of relationship. Billy brought lunch, and then Billy walked home and goes, Mom, you're never going to believe you are not going to believe we need to take lunches every day. 
you won't believe what God, he may have taken home a doggy bag with some of the leftovers. Mom, like, where'd you get that? That's part of what you said. I didn't send you with that. Yeah, but Jesus was involved. So here's the challenge. Do we, do we get to enjoy this blessing of forgiveness and salvation and the filling of God's presence in our lives? with all that brings and do we have to walk around doing this or we just bring our lunch to the table and say here it's all I got and watch Jesus do amazing things I'm going to challenge you today that what you think you have is really a pittance compared to what God wants to produce in your life And the good news is you can come sometimes feeling like you're bringing nothing but you get to be part of the story because God begins to fill, distribute, grace our lives with these blessings and we in turn get to bless others with those things. This is not the popular get rich quick scheme that fills our world. This is the give it all away and see what God does method of blessing. As we wrap it up this morning, I just want to challenge you with that thought, and that is this. What are you hanging on to so dearly? Philippians 4, 23 tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You do realize that the blessing you have came from him. You do realize that he has multiple layers of blessing that he wants to pour into our lives if we submit to him. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would please and if you're online with us just take a moment right there in the privacy of your home or wherever you're watching. Heavenly Father we thank you this morning that you are you are the amazing God who has graced our lives with so many blessings. Lord, we cannot outgive you. We cannot, we cannot perform to a level that is, is good without your help in our lives. The absolute necessity for each and every one of us is to come each and every day and surrender our life and our will to the care and control of Christ. And when we submit ourselves to you, when we let go and let God Lord, there's amazing things that can happen. You have a plan for our lives. Lord, your word confirms that. And Lord, there are times that we've there are times that we've walked outside of that plan. There are times that we have gone in a different direction. Lord, you don't find another plan. You just bring us back to your original plan for our lives. As the songwriter said years ago, there have been times. Although there have been times I've been out of your will, I've never been out of your care. And Lord, I pray today that wherever we are, that we would just recognize and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. Lord, your word says that if we confess, you'll forgive. So Lord, we confess today. We need you, Lord. We can't do this without you. So Lord, if there's wrongdoing, if there's sin in my life, I ask today, Lord, that you would Purify me, cleanse me, make me what you want me to be. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and power. Use me, O God, to be that voice of hope. Lord, I pray that you would take the meager gifts that I offer and, Lord, use them to bless others. And Lord, may I become totally and completely dependent on you, Lord Jesus. Not on my own resources, not on my own well-being, not on my own giftedness. But Lord, help me to come and surrender all of that to you. And allow you to change the world around me because of your life in me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Take a moment before we wrap this up this morning and just allow his Holy Spirit to speak into your life personally and
just challenge you today to be that person he's calling all of us to be. Stand with me if you're able, would you please? And I want to pray a blessing over you before we leave today. But I pray God would open your ears and open your eyes and open your heart, open your hands to be that source of hope and healing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And you're going out and you're coming in and you're rising up and you're lying down and you're in your labor and your leisure and your laughter and in your tears until one day we all stand before him whom Job spoke about when he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And like Job, until that day when these eyes will see him face to face. God be with you and bless you in all that you do. Go out and be a blessing to those around you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.